Hello and welcome to The Herd Has Spoken, a podcast brought to you by Muskox Men's Apparel. Hello, Muskox Herd. This is Brad Hoos, your host of The Herd Has Spoken. I'm excited to bring you episode number 23 today with my good friend, Sean Singleton. Sean is an Air Force Academy graduate who grew up in coastal Georgia where he learned from his father that he had to be twice as good as the next guy just to be considered average as a black man growing up in the South. And Sean has certainly accomplished that in in terms of evolving from uh, humble upbringings in the beautiful town of, of Savannah, Georgia, to now being an investor on Sand Hill Road in Silicon Valley. Sean brings together investors, entrepreneurs, and folks that are experts in the military technology arena to help make America a safer place. What more could you want from someone that's part of the Muskox Herd? We appreciate, Sean, we appreciate you for listening and do yourself a favor. Go ahead and check out gomuskox.com for all of your outdoor men's apparel needs. And with no further ado, my conversation with Sean Singleton. Sean Singleton, welcome to The Herd Has Spoken. My pleasure. Thanks so much for the opportunity of catching up with you. Yeah, abs- absolutely. So you're a man that has sat across the table from some of the biggest investors in Silicon Valley. You're in the process of enhancing America's military strength and American security through tech and entrepreneurship. And I'm excited to get all to get into all of that. But before we do, I want to go back to coastal Georgia. So you you grew up in the South, in the, in the wonderful state of, of Georgia. And I would love to hear what your childhood experience was like. Well, thank you for the question. And it was a really wonderful childhood experience. And so we lived in Savannah, Georgia for the early parts of my life when we eventually made our way up to Atlanta for four years, which were completely transformative. Um, so growing up in coastal Georgia, it's a really wonderful place. If you've ever been to Savannah, it's a pretty genteel area, known for Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Johnny Mercer and a whole host of other really cool things. Paula Dean is also a resident of the great state of Georgia, city of Savannah. And so it's Justice Clarence Thomas. Yet it's a very small town, very coastal. Um, so we get a lot of international participation, but we're very stuck in our ways. And so when we went to Atlanta and I was about 10 years old, we lived in a place that had access to just so much great opportunity. They had a program called Minority to Majority where African-American students were able to get bus to majority white schools. And through that experience, I ended up learning about Led Zeppelin, um, the police and a host of other different things. And I also learned the about telecom, stuff. the important stuff, you know, the five greatest bands in the history of rock and roll. You had also got exposure to technology, media and telecom. Some of my uh, friends, fathers and mothers were technology executives. Some had worked at Coca-Cola. And so that opened up a whole new vein of what was possible out there. And then we moved back to Savannah, Georgia, ended up going to a math science program. Didn't necessarily want to go to a service academy, but my dad grew up watching the Army and Navy football game and uh, made a couple of phone calls, went through the process and ended up going to the Air Force Academy, which really sort of adjusted the complete trajectory of life. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. I still go back to Savannah as frequently as I possibly can, you know, with the Savannah College of Art and Design down there. It's just a really cool, quirky place. And I encourage everybody to get a chance to go down there. Um, if you don't like the heat, don't go in July, August, or September. But if you do like St. Patrick's Day, definitely go in March. Okay, so lots of lots of good things to explore in in Georgia, particularly in in Savannah. And you can't go wrong with good 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 food from Paula Dean and good good uh, good legal legislation from Clarence Thomas. So you're you're in good you're in good company there. Um, but but I'd love to talk about your time in Atlanta. A, a little mm-hmm. bit. So you mentioned this program, Minority to Majority. Mm-hmm. How how did how did you happen to get into this program, and and what what did that mean to to you? So really interestingly enough, a cousin of mine, actually two cousins, they lived in the same house that we occupied in Atlanta. They moved out into this very affluent area in the northern parts of uh, the Cap County. They were part of the program initially, and they explained to my mother that it was a really wonderful 
opportunity that they had. And so obviously my mother decided to go ahead and fill out some of the paperwork. I ended up going, following literally in their footsteps to go to the same school. And that's how we found out about the program. Now, when I went to a place called Vanderlyn Elementary, I was one of seven African-American students out of, I think, 2000. And so that was a really interesting culture shock. Yet at the same time, what I took away from that was that everybody was pretty much the same. Um, and I still keep in touch with some of the folks from almost 35 years ago that were there. So I'm tipping my hand as far as how old I am. But uh, yeah, it was a really eye-opening experience because these kids had a completely different way of life, completely different sight set. And to be able to go ahead and take what I grew up with in Southeast Georgia, combine that with them, it was actually a pretty symbiotic uh, series of friendships that have built up there. And and what age what age were you when you entered into this program? I was 10 years old. 10 years old. So at, at age 10, you're starting to have your own opinions and thoughts, but you, those those are still pretty early stage. So for, for you entering into this program and suddenly being one of seven African Americans out of a thousand, was, was that 2000 out of 2000? Thank you. Was, was that, was that particularly challenging or was it just a norm that you quickly en- entered into and didn't really think too much about it? I, I could see it going either way. And I would love to hear about what that experience was like. Going back in my memory, the first couple of days took a little bit of getting used to yet after that first week telling a couple of jokes getting a couple of really awesome cool friends it was a pretty seamless transition um so much so four years later when we moved back to savannah i was i was upset for a number of years because that was such a wonderful experience and i was Mm -hmm. worried about what my life would look like if i didn't stay in that environment you know you build up a lot of great friends in that really critical period of your life when you're 10 to 13 years old and then all of a sudden be sort of forced away from that you know and it's not a part of your choice um it took a while to get used to yeah so you go back then to savannah Mm -hmm. you enter this math and science program did you feel like you were able to fit in and connect in the same way that you could when you were in atlanta So it was interesting in the sense that as I went back to Savannah, it was more difficult for me to transition back into Savannah. And the reason why is that the people that knew me before we moved to Atlanta said I had changed, Uh, changed so much that they didn't recognize who I was. Um, Not too dissimilar from what Tim Scott just suffered as a result of giving the rebuttal to the president's um, bicameral address with some of the things that were, you know, passed along to me as a result of making the transition back to Atlanta to Savannah. Sure. Mm, that's, that's, that's an interesting ex- experience where you've, you've grown and, and evolved in a way that you were clearly very happy with, but in, in somehow this, this meant that people had a hard time reacclimating you into the, into the community because you, you were, you were a different man. You'd had different, different experiences. Um, and, and did that leave a, a lasting impression on you? Do you feel more connected to your time in in Savannah, or did you ultimately, excuse me, in in Atlanta, or do you ultimately feel more connected to Savannah because you grew up there and then you went back there for for your high school period? So the wonderful people of Savannah welcomed me back, welcomed the family back because we had been in Savannah as families for about 150 years. So it took a little bit of time, but Savannah is home, will always be home. The great citizens of Savannah and Chatham County are my people. And uh, I love getting back down there. So there is no substitute whatsoever. And it's interesting because there's a rivalry between Savannah and Atlanta. They were burned down in 1864 by Sherman. We were given as a gift to Lincoln for Christmas of 1864. So there's always been that rivalry since then. And so Southerners, we have very long memories. Uh, (laughs) And so Savannah, those are my people. Love Atlanta, yet Savannah, those are my people. I get it. I get it. Well, I appreciate that. Well, a- another person that that's extremely close to you, obviously, is is your father, and it's it's interesting to hear hear that it was your father who loved the Army Navy game, and then you know, as as a son of a Navy captain here, I have to say, m- got confused, made the mistake somehow of encouraging his son then to go into the Air Force uh, a- Academy. But but what did that look like? Because you mentioned this wasn't high on your list of priorities at this time in life, yet somehow you wound up matriculating at the Air Force Academy. How did that play out? 
So uh, the actual application process or actually going to Colorado Springs or, or what? I'm I want to hear about how you wound up going there, even though this wasn't something that was on your radar and you weren't excited about it necessarily, but your father thought it was a good idea. So, yeah, again, he grew up with the Army Navy game. I mean, all of the pomp and circumstance to tradition. I mean, he liked the Dallas Cowboys. So Roger Starbuck, the Tom Landry thing, you know, Roger Starbuck being a Naval Academy graduate. So, you know, just some pretty pristine people. Right. And so he was like, hey, my son should go there. Meanwhile, I'm applying to a lot of really awesome schools and getting into all of them and getting actual scholarship to go. And so I thought I was going to have a little bit more of the Animal House experience, not wearing polyester and actually doing push ups and getting yelled at for the better part of four years. Um, and so I got in. I, I honestly, it was by the grace of God that I got in. Um, past the physical fitness, past the academic, past the interview. And ended up going, and I'll tell you what, how infinitely unprepared I was for it. Have you ever been to Colorado Springs? I have not been to Colorado Springs. I've been all around Colorado Springs, but never to that city in particular. Got it, got it. Well, Colorado Springs is much like a, a, a Coyote Roadrunner kind of cartoon as far as the landscape in the eastern part where there's tumbleweeds that go across the uh, highways, at least back in the early 90s. So flying to Colorado Springs, keep in mind, I missed my flight from Savannah, I mean, from Charleston, because the way the airports does it is that they try to give you as many legs on a ticket as possible because it's a cheaper ticket, right? Sure. So, so I had five connections to go from Savannah to Colorado Springs. <laughs> I go and I get something to eat in a restaurant in the Charleston airport. And the one restaurant I go into doesn't have an intercom system. And they're saying the last call for passengers from Charleston to Chicago, Illinois, Gates will close in 10 minutes. Finish up my meal. I get to the gate. Gates closed. Planes gone. I end up getting in late to Denver Stapleton Airport when Stapleton still existed as an airport with another 12 hours before my flight from Denver to Colorado Springs is supposed to take me down to the zoo, as we call it. I ended up befriending the Embassy Suites driver of the van, and I just rode around with him all night long, going back and forth, doing shuttle runs between Stapleton and and the Embassy Suites Hotel, just catching up on, you know, what life is like in Colorado. So the next day I get on the plane, fly from Denver to Colorado Springs, which is basically a javelin throw, you know, as far as air travel goes. Get off, get on the bus, and there's tumbleweeds everywhere. And I'm like, where am I right now? Because I'm coming from this really lush place that is Savannah, Georgia, into this really high arid desert that is Colorado Springs. So we get on the bus, we're all sort of shell-shocked, those of us that flew in and we're riding on the bus. And we get to the Air Force Academy and there's a ramp there that's pretty famous if you've ever been. It used to be known as the Bring Me Men ramp, they've since rechanged it. And at the base of the ramp, the bus is stopped. And then the upper class cadets come in, very tightly pressed uniforms, they get on the bus and they immediately start yelling at you to get you in shape. I looked at the gentleman, keep in mind, there's about 45 of us on the bus. And I said, excuse me, sir, why are you yelling at us? We don't know you. <laughs> the rest of the students thought that that was really funny. Ha ha ha, he did not. June 29th, 1990 was the longest day of my entire life because not only did this gentleman not find what I said funny, the other 200 upper-class cadets did not find out I mean, found out what I said and did not find it funny. You were Mark so, Dooley at that moment. I was Mark Dooley for the next year <laughs> from that moment. <laughs> so that's what happened. So once you transition in, you get used to the pace of being there. Some of the best friends I still have today go back to June 29th. Um, four years there, you hate it most of the times while you're there. You can't wait to see it in the rearview mirror at graduation, yet you spend the rest of your life trying to get back there because it means that much to you. Sean, it's funny you should mention relationships because you're one of the most relationally focused people that that I know. And I think that's something that you do fantastically well. And obviously that's a big part of your your success in terms of bringing, uh, bringing together what have historically been disparate organizations in terms of entrepreneurship and government and military and, and technology. But, but I'm curious from, from your time in your childhood and, and maybe your time from the Air Force Academy as, as well, how do you think you started to develop that relational focus? Because it's obviously something that's very core to, to who you are. And I'd love to hear kind of what you see looking back, 
were the early building blocks of that fantastic relationship building skill that you currently have. Oh, I appreciate the kind words. And it's just something that's actually literally in my mitochondrial DNA. I can't help it. <laughs> um, it goes back to nursery school. Um, I was building relationships with a lot of friends there. Um, I got in trouble a lot um, for a sort of standing out. That sounds right. Yeah, yeah. Trying to represent the kids. So, you know, shoot the arrows this way and leave them alone. Um, and because of that kind of attitude, a lot of people sort of confide in you in certain things and then that, they ha that you have their back. And the more you can demonstrate that you have someone's back, the more that they're willing to trust in you. And for whatever reason, I just don't forget a lot of stuff. And so if you tell me something and if I know something over here that can connect you and make you feel better or actually help you from a business standpoint, I'm more than happy to go ahead and facilitate that conversation because at the end of the day, if I can help you, you're going to end up helping somebody else. And then we all stand to benefit from that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So one of the things that I think is so important for quote unquote networking is that people always think about, oh, who can I meet? What job can I get? Where can I go? And from my perspective, that's 180 degrees different than what how you should be, <laughs> be approaching networking. I mean, for, for me, the rules, the three rules of networking are give first, give second, don't worry about what's next. Um, and, and it sounds like that's kind of like how, how you were, you were wired and, and how you were thinking about things from, from the jump. Absolutely. And so when we went through recruiting to build on your point, it was one of the most fun periods of time being at business school, because it was an opportunity to get to know our classmates, to get to know firms and connect the two of them. And so I love the little, you know, get together is that we would have cocktail parties and whatnot, and just sort of remembering facts about Brad and remembering facts about say, Oh, Sun Kwong or Patrick Payne, and then bringing that up into conversation to make them look good. Cause that made me feel better. You know? Yeah, absolutely. No, it, it's great. I mean, that's one of the, the, the fantastic things. So Sean and I did go to business school to, together. We won't talk about the number of years it's been since we, we went together. Um, but, but we did go to business school together. And it, one of the things that's most fun is to be able to sort of brag on your your friends now and, and folks who are doing all these cool things so um i'm secretly you know get, giddy like a schoolgirl here getting a chance to to talk with <laughs> with sean to to be able to to do that so you you you, were, you went to the air force academy we we chatted about that um sounds like it was a, a love hate that skewed more towards love as the the years have have gone on um with respect to to your your time um in colorado springs and, and I'd love to hear a little bit about <clears throat> after you'd graduated from the academy, some of your work in, in the Air Force. I mean, some of it sounds pretty fantastic and really fascinating from, from the outside in. So you, you're a special agent with the Office of Special Investigation. So I always knew you were a special person, Sean, but I didn't realize that we had gone, gone as far as to indoctrinate that into titles. But what, what, what the heck does that even really mean to be a special agent in the Office of Special Investigations in the Air Force? Well, have you seen the show NCIS? I have, yes. Okay, so the Air Force has its equivalent, the Army has its equivalent, and so I was with the Air Force Office of Special Investigations after doing a three-year stint in Dayton, Ohio at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base on the F-22 program. And that was really fascinating to actually help and be a part of an effort to build a next-generation air superiority fighter. Did that in Dayton, loved it, wanted to be in Washington, D.C. AFOSI, as it's called, is headquartered in the National Capital Region. I saw a job posted in the Air Force Internal Bulletin Board. Applied for it, not thinking that I would get it, because keep in mind, these are the people that police the Air Force. So we are the organization that's responsible for solving violent crime, impacting men and women in uniform, in the Air Force specifically. We also do a number of cyber investigations, so a lot of the cyber crimes in the cyber theft really started to proliferate in the mid to late 90s. We were sort of at the tip of the spear of that. And the area where I focused in on was more along the lines of human intelligence or counter spying. Um, and so just being able to go ahead and make sure that America and the Air Force stayed safe. So did that three years active duty, um, six years as a, seven years as a reservist when I separated from active duty. But yeah, that's what we do is to try to keep the Air Force safe. And we actually do joint investigations with the Federal Bureau of Investigations our sister agencies across the services, um, DEA, ATF, all of them. We're a federal law enforcement organization with a specific focus on the military. And, and was that challenging for you in, in instances where you had to go and dig in and investigate into 
uh, other men of uniform and other men and women of, of uniform, excuse me, to, as, as you went, went through that, was, was that hard to, to need to investigate? Uh, because you obviously have known how much, how much hard work has gone into being able to, to put on that uniform and, and, and serve, but at the same time you had a job to do as, as well. So uh, what was that like in terms of going through those investigations of what it sounds like was, was often peers at one, one level or another? Yeah, so it's difficult, yet at the same time, you take an oath to the Constitution. And if you take an oath to the Constitution and you are sworn in as a federal law enforcement officer, you need to adhere to the rules and the Constitution. And so it is, in fact, difficult at the same time. You try to be as dispassionate as you possibly can be, because at the end of the day, the facts need to remain supreme. And you don't editorialize. In fact, they teach us if we're ever going to testify to anything that we've investigated, you don't editorialize in your reports because it's discoverable. You don't editorialize in your notes. And most important, importantly, when you approach a case and you're gathering those facts, you don't try to jump to conclusions. So you really sort of have to fight a little bit of your lizard brain mm -hmm. when you're doing these things because you really want to go ahead and start connecting dots. Oftentimes, though, the fact pattern that it ultimately reveals itself to you is completely different than what you initially thought. So I think that that's probably the biggest thing is just countering what you're naturally inclined to do as making a judgment versus actually investigating someone that you might personally know, which has happened on a couple of occasions in my instance. So for, for you, what was the most memorable case that, that you worked on? So this was actually when I was called back to active duty. And so I separated from active duty in 2000 and September 11th happened obviously right after that. Got called back to be at the Pentagon um, I wanted to go to someplace overseas. Lawrence of Arabia is my favorite film, right? T.E. Lawrence is somebody I idolize. I wanted to go traipse across someplace in the Middle East with the Far East and actually, you know, be boots on the ground there. Well, since I wasn't married and I didn't have children, they said, no, sir, you're going to go to the Pentagon. And so that's where I got assigned was to the Pentagon and had a number of really interesting cases because, as you can remember, the Pentagon was one of the destinations of, unfortunately, a tragedy that you know visited us on September 11th. And as a result of that, there was heightened sensitivities all in and around the national capital region. So we were always tracking you know, movements of various folks that were persons of interest. So I can't go into too much detail yet. There were a lot of really exhilarating conversations and activities that took place in that 12 month period of being reactivated into the Air Force that I'm really proud of working on a great team out of the Pentagon detachment for AFOSI. Yeah, I can only imagine how much there there was there to, to unpack because that was a time of such uncertainty. And part of your job and your team's job, and I'm sure across um, all, all the all the different branches of the military was to try to get that clarity, and that certainty and that understanding of what happened how the reactions uh, took place and who who may have been at, at fault for certain you know aspects of things. So I want to respect um, I want to respect the the appropriate level of um, of secrecy with 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 that. But you you did mention that you you continued to serve in in the Air Force both in an active role and then more of a reserve capacity. And then you've since transitioned out of the of the Air Force into the civilian world. Although I know you're. You, your the Air Force holds a, a special place in, in your heart to this day. But <clears throat> what was that transition like? Why did you decide to transition out of the, of the Air Force? And then what were the months like following that transition? Because I know that can be a very challenging period for a, a lot of folks who've, who've served the United States of America. Yeah, it was definitely a period of transition, no question about it. Um, it was actually one of the more stressful periods because not only was I separating from active duty, I was going to the AFOSI Academy to become a special agent as a reservist. And I was also doing a job search, right? And when you're military, you really don't have an understanding of what the civilian world is. I remember when I got my first paycheck, I was irate because I saw this line item that said FICA. And I was like, who the hell is FICA and why they're taking my money? Um, and so you don't have that when you're an active duty officer. With that being said, when I was on active duty, it was wonderful to wear the uniform but it quickly dawned on me that the people that were responsible for the most impactful change in the military didn't wear the uniform. And what I mean by that is, is that people that wear the uniform are there to execute and be operational. 
the people that set the tenor and the tone for the Air Force and the larger DOD are typically civilians and growingly so the people that are systems integrators or the contractors or the Beltway Bandits, I prefer to call them Parkway Patriots that actually service the government. So I wanted to go ahead and separate from active duty, still stay involved as a reservist, yet at the same time go into a channel where I could have, at least my perception was at the time, a greater impact on what the Air Force and the Department of Defense were going to do moving forward. So that's why I transitioned out, but it was definitely a, a difficult transition because there's so much you don't know and you have to ask a lot of questions and you have to take a lot of advice from a lot of people that you don't necessarily know if they're right, but they have a much better perspective than you because you don't have one. Right. Yeah. I can, I can certainly appreciate the, the challenges there. And, and one of the things that so many folks struggle with is sort of like the mental health aspect of things transitioning out. Was, was that something that was, was hard for, for you as part of that transition? Actually it wasn't. So when I was at the air force office of special investigations, my boss, who is still someone who I consider a mentor, his name is Francis X. Taylor, one of the most amazing Americans that this country has ever produced. He allowed me to become a thing called the White House Social Aid. Well, if you're familiar with the White House Social Aid, those are the people that give the president the medals of honor to pin on the recipients. They're the people with the agulets that whisper in his ear or the first lady's ear as far as who's what head of state they're talking to. Sure. They're the people that operate in the background that sort of make sure that these large diplomatic events flow rather in a linear fashion. So I had the opportunity to be in a White House social aide for two and a half years when I was in Washington, DC. And that group of friends that were the fellow social aides were my support group as I was transitioning out. In fact, one of my closest friends, he was the senior White House social aide, his father helped get me my first civilian job. And so as a result of those relationships coming back to it, right, right. I was able to go ahead and actually transition out with not as much anxiety as I think a lot of other folks would have had or okay. have when they do. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's not surprising that, you know, one of your greatest strengths was <laughs> something that carried you through one of the, the traditionally most challenging parts of a military career, which is a transition out of the, of the military. So you, you, you transitioned out successfully. Um, have obviously gone through a lot of things. Uh, I want to kind of maybe fast forward through some of the years of, of your career, if that's okay. Um, you ultimately wound up going back to business school, which is where we had the, the honor and privilege of getting to, to know one another initially. Um, and then you've spent some time at one of the most respected banks in the, in the world, JP Morgan, both uh, on the private investment side um, or, or, and then wealth management, and then also in the investment banking side. And you've eventually sort of made your way into owning and running Oglethorpe Capital, where you're, you now have a mission that to me is something that sounds extremely important um, but I'd love to hear it from from your words, where you are with Oglethorpe and what exactly Oglethorpe Capital um, exists in order to, to be able to do. Thank you. And so Oglethorpe is the aggregation of 25 years of activity going all the way back to being a military officer, a systems integrator, an investment banker, and an asset manager. So how it all came about was this way. So I ended up joining you and the rest of the cohort of 552 Booth classmates um, as a result of a contract engagement I had at the Department of State. There was a wonderful person who was leading our, our consulting team who had gone to Darden at University of Virginia. She was so fantastically polished in front of the client. I asked her, I was like, how does one obtain that kind of sheen in presenting themselves to customers? And she said, business school. And so she was my uh, Sherpa through the entire process of eventually going to Booth and meeting up with you and the rest of the rest of the team there. And when we went through recruiting, as we alluded to, the recruiting piece was a lot of fun. The figuring out what you're going to do post-graduation <laughs> is the hard part. Absolutely. And, and being a former Air Force officer, systems integrator in the National Capital Region, you don't have tax and business strategy. You don't have generally accepted accounting principles. That's not in your common vocabulary. So it was rather difficult to go from zero to 60 in the span of two years to get even qualified to work at JP Morgan, yet was able to go ahead and pull it off. And as a result of some of that corporate finance experience and then transitioning over to the asset management side of business, 
got a pretty robust picture of what individuals and corporations need to do in order to be successful in the long term. And when I eventually came out to San Francisco to be with my now wife, I was working for JP Morgan on their investor desk in downtown San Francisco. When one of my former clients approached me and said, hey, if you decide to go off and hang out your own shingle as a boutique M&A advisor, I will go ahead and be your first client. And that's how Oglethorpe came to fruition in January of 2013. And the focus of Oglethorpe is to actually help micro and small cap companies have liquidity events through engagements in dual use activities. And what I mean by dual use, commercially focused companies that are willing to take on Department of Defense or public sector use cases. So if you're a cybersecurity company and you're focused on the financial sector, like a JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs or whatever, you're doing some really cool things in the cyber domain that DOD cares about, right? Those big bulge bracket banks or sizable banks are dealing with trillions of transactions on an annualized basis. DOD is not dealing with the same volume, yet the information is more sensitive and of a national security import. So being able to go ahead and help these companies bridge that divide is where Oglethorpe places its time and attention. Um, it's been a lot of fun. And if you go back to the origins of Silicon Valley, it was actually due in part to either the space program or the nuclear program. Yet roughly around the late 80s, DOD decided to drop Mike in Silicon Valley and left this treasure trove of intellectual property that folks like Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, and the rest just sort of picked up and aggregated and brought to you iPhones and all the other different things. In fact, there are 47 different pieces of intellectual property that you and I paid for as taxpayers that went into the iPhone. And the DOD and the federal government gets not one cent from that seeding of the investment. So I'm trying to change that in a very surreptitious way, because as you can imagine, there are a lot of firmly entrenched interest, but using relationship skills and sort of bridging these divides, trying to get Wall Street, the National Capital Region, and Silicon Valley get on the same sheet of music. Yeah, and, and, and I guess that's a, that's a mighty job, but it's, a, it's an important job. So one of the things that I know you'd, you'd shared with me previously is when we're, when we're talking about America's military might and where the United States stands relative to other nations, there is a huge need to develop technology and innovation through entrepreneurship, but in a way that can be at scale and with sufficient capital to be able to not just have America at parity with other nations and superpowers, but to be able to be above parity with mm -hmm. that. And, and so you have, you have crafted this very lofty goal over, over time and, and certainly appreciate that your goal is to be able to help the small cap and the mid cap organizations be able to have those liquidity events with, with Oglethorpe through that dual use that, that you, you mentioned. But how, how did you come to take on you know, such, such a weighty goal and be able to start getting in the room with so many of these huge Silicon Valley in investors. So you, 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 you know, we've talked about your journey from coastal Georgia to, to Silicon Valley, but it, it's not as simple as arriving in Silicon Valley and being able to have these doors open to you. And, and let's, let's be honest, particularly as, as a black man from, from Georgia, there, there's some real structural challenges associated with being able to, to get there. So how did you start being able to get your foot in the door just a, a little bit and then continue to expand in the world of Silicon Valley? Wow, it's um, like Paul McCartney wrote, Long and Winding Road, no question about <laughs> it. And it really happened because of the Air Force Academy. I'm not gonna lie to you. Um, so when I came out to San Francisco to be with my now wife and um, we went to an Air Force Academy event and as I was looking to do something a little bit more interesting, at least in my mind, through Oglethorpe, ended up going to a reception with a gentleman who unfortunately passed last November, but he was a class of 71 graduate by the name of Bill Coleman. Now, if you remember a middleware provider um, called BEA Systems, the B in BEA Systems, which was sold to Oracle for $8.5 billion, the B was Bill Coleman. Bill was somebody who took me under his wing and introduced me to one of his investing partners, a gentleman by the name of Gilman Louie, who was the first CEO of InQtel, and he's doing a phenomenal job with Alsop Louie. He was also on the recently convened National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, one of the commissioners there. And between the two of them and a couple of other folks with Air Force backgrounds, they actually got me into some conversations that was eminently unqualified for. 
but I tried to be to fly on the wall and take in as much as I possibly could. Because of some of the activity that was done through those gentlemen, and then also some of the activity that was done with Oglethorpe, I had a wonderful opportunity of coming to a thing that's now known as the Defense and Innovation Unit, DIU. At the time, it was DIUX, the Defense Innovation Unit Experimental. And getting back to the origins of Silicon Valley, no, you were going to ask something. I, I was, yeah, this Defense Innovation Unit. So, so that sounds that sounds like something that's that's very fascinating. When when you got introduced to it, just just to clarify the timeline, this was after your time in the Air Force Academy. This was after Bill Coleman had sort of introduced you to this to this world, and then you discovered this Defense Innovation Unit. Am, am I am I tracking you correctly here? Absolutely, and just sort of put a timeline to it. Graduate from Air Force Academy in 1994, six years active duty, six years in the National Capital Region as a systems integrator, come to Booth, graduate five years at J.P. Morgan. So now it's 2013, 2014, I'm in the Valley and I'm having these conversations. And one of the things that was happening roughly around this time is that DOD recognized that they were so woefully behind our peer competitors or near peer competitors at the time, the mm-hmm. Chinese and the Russians. And the only way that we were going to claw our way back is to harness the great activity and energy that was happening in innovation ecosystems around the country. So the 128 corridor in Massachusetts, you know, there um, in the beautiful state of Michigan, national capital region, central Texas, front range of Colorado, and specifically out here in Silicon Valley in the Pacific Northwest. And so there was a number of convoys coming out from the Pentagon saying, how do we get you to work better with us, Silicon Valley? And that's how I was a fly on the wall with a lot of these conversations. These conversations culminated in the creation of DIUX at the time in August of 2015. Now, like most startups, the initial plan ends up becoming at something that the entity pivots from. And so DIUX, when it was created in 2015, was to be a embassy model to where if you had great tech, you were to come and talk to us there were going to be representatives from all of these government agencies, and they were going to go ahead and figure out how to wedge your tech back into the enterprise. Sure. For nine so, and a half months, the organization did that. But continue, please. No. So you you were basically said, hey, we have this great idea. We, we have the military, we have connections and the people who recognize the problem at the Department of Defense in terms of needing to, to drive technical in, innovation. And then we have connections to a bunch of these startups. We can do our, our best to get all these startups together in one room with the, with the Department of, of Defense. And that was basically the initial concept, correct? That was the initial concept that was a glaring failure. And what ended up happening was, and this is still something that plays the Department of Defense and the federal government, it's infinitely impossible to wedge new technology into legacy business processes. Sure. At the end of the day, DIU now is more McKinsey, Bain, or BCG, or an Accenture than they ever will be a tech foraging operation. And the reason why I said it is because you have to re-engineer a business process, understand what mission outcomes you want to have, and then find the technology that actually reinforces that re-engineered business process. It took us several years to figure that out. And as a result of figuring that out, I got exposure to the folks at Andreessen Horowitz, Kleiner Perkins, Sequoia, and NEA, which is where I have probably the most robust relationship, New Enterprise Associates, one of the biggest, not the biggest venture capital firm in the world. But and and for those, day, I, I just want to interrupt you here because for those who aren't familiar with Silicon Valley, I mean, th- this is the New York Yankees, the Green Bay Packers, the Dallas Cowboys, all in one of Silicon Valley that, that Sean just listed off. I mean, th- these are the heaviest of the heavy hitters in Silicon Valley from an investment perspective. I mean, basically every every large tech firm of the last 20 years that has had venture capital investment has had one of these organizations f- funding them. So I just want to share that per- perspective as you go through your, your story here, because th- this is no small accomplishment to be able to list off this list of, of venture capital firms. Well, it's been a true blessing. In fact, one of the people that I mentioned earlier was in the room with John Doerr when this individual came in with this really cool concept after he left his role in Wall Street for selling books online. <laughs> and so this individual was in the room when Bezos pitched his idea for Amazon. And so being able to tap into that level of expertise has been really wonderful as I've built out Oglethorpe, trying to do what I'm doing on the Bullion space. And all of those firms care about keeping the U.S. beyond parity, which has been really encouraging to sort of see that we're more alike than we are different. 
and and along those lines, right? Because <clears throat> because I do think this is an, an important topic that that I want to want to make sure we get a chance to to chat through a, a, a little bit. So, how has the journey in this venture capital world been harder as an African American man, where there are few people sitting around the table that that look like you? I'll say it to you like this: They use the term unicorn to describe companies. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty much like that. I mean, a, a group of us get together on a periodic basis and we talk about how do we increase the amount of, you know, brown and black participation on Sand Hill Road, which is the Wall Street equivalent in the venture space. And, you know, it's going to be a long slog. I mean, Andreessen Horowitz has put together their cultural leadership fund where they have folks like Kevin Durant, Shonda Rhimes and all of that leveraging their great heft as entertainers to get greater exposure to tech. Yet it goes even deeper than that. Of how do you go ahead and take folks that are graduating from Booth, Stanford, HBS that might go to Wall Street that are brown and black to at least look at Santo Road and to actually work with those firms to understand that there is great benefit in the diversity of thought to where you could actually probably have greater rates of return and multiples on the invested capital if you have varying perspectives into there. So that's another passion that actually sort of is riding with what I'm trying to do from a dual use public private sector collaboration standpoint. But yeah, it's difficult. But at the same time, if you can demonstrate value in this country, people want people on the team that can actually drive returns. And so you always have to lead with that of how can I make the enterprise better? How can I make the fund actually appreciate more? How can I help these companies realize value quicker? If you do that, people could care less what you look like on the outside. Yeah, and, and I think one of the, the, the great pieces of data that exists is that we know when you have an executive team or you have a board that's more diverse, the returns are better, right? So when you when you have a, a board or an executive team of all white men, the returns are not as strong as when you have people of color and when you have women in these leadership roles. So there, we, we all know that data exists and, and it's out there, yet there's still this challenge and there's still this inertia that that exists i actually think like this is where the relationship piece is is a double-edged sword so someone like you sean you you know you use the term unicorn um to to describe yes investments but of course you as well with your with your relationships that you've started forging in your in your mitochondrial dna to use your your term from the the day that you were you were born but those relationships while they're really important, and I don't want to ever discount relationships that, that people have, but they have the, the impact of, of, let's just keep it from a, a business and a dollars and cents perspective of, of limiting the returns of these companies because you have you know, le leadership that looks way too, way too homogenous. So that's one of the things that's been most head scratching for me and from my perspective is that there is the data that's out there I think people intellectually understand the, the data, yet it's still really hard to be able to move the needle and change the way things have happened for so long because of the, the relationship. So yeah, I, I don't know quite where I'm going with this other than to say, it, it feels like the relationships are both a one of the strongest assets of Silicon Valley to be able to have one place to get this fantastic deal flow, but it's also one of the biggest issues and biggest challenges that exist in, in Silicon Valley. And I'm, I'm very happy that you're out there trying to, trying to solve that. But I would love your take on what does the future look like when we look out two, three, four, five, ten 10 years when it comes to making investments and trying to do so in a way that has better returns associated with more diversity um, in, in those investments in those leadership teams. Oh, well, I appreciate you sharing that perspective and context. And it's going to take execution. It's actually going to take the realization of some liquidity events that people take notice of, right? That's the beautiful thing about numbers is that they don't lie. And so if you're able to go ahead and have a couple of material deals and you're known as the person or a group of people that were responsible for having a company that was valued at say maybe $500 million into becoming valued at 5 billion in the span of 24 months because of the material things that you had contributed to the conversation, 
that will turn some heads. And then when you start to develop a reputation that's not too dissimilar from Wall Street of being the guy or the lady responsible for X, Y, and Z, people will find you and they will definitely become colorblind as time goes on. It's very similar to what happened in 1947 with Jackie Robinson. You know, there were a lot of folks that just said, hey, and I'm not comparing myself to Jackie Robinson at all. So please do not take that from, from this at all. My point is, yeah, is you, that you, you can't swing a baseball like Jack, a baseball bat like Jackie. Let's be not honest. Even close, not even <laughs> close. Wasn't as fast, wasn't as charming, wasn't nearly as patient. With that being said, being someone who can demonstrate value that can actually help the team win really sort of gets a number of the other investors and some of the other portfolio companies to sort of take a second look and to understand that going from the ethereal that we understand what the research says that diversity works to the actual is what's gonna be what it takes to change and move the needle. I love that, I love that. So so for you, what what what's next, right? So what what are you planning to continue to, to do um, with, with Oglethorpe, with your role? I know, um, you know the greatest thing you can do is to be successful in your quote unquote day, day job. And I know you're working across so many different things um, and, and you're a man that, that sleeps very, very few hours to, to, get, to get that done in another day. I'd love to, to cover that in more, more detail, but would love to hear kind of what, what's next. How, how do you see things advancing going forward, both for you and what you're trying to accomplish in, in the industry as a whole? So over the next 12 to 18 months, there are going to be some really big announcements is what my vision and hope happens to be. I think as a result of what we as a world went through, specifically this nation over the last 14 months, there's an acute sensitivity to make sure that we onshore a number of critical things to maintain an American way of life. And so I'm involved in some of those conversations of how do we go ahead and increase the collaboration between the public and the private sectors to where we don't find ourselves flat-footed in the future, right? So there's going to be some announcements on that. I love it. There are also going to be some announcements, is, which is where I'm focused Oglethorpe's attention to date, is the maximization of human performance. And so a couple of the companies that I represent are ones that are building an augmented reality contact lens, right? So if you remember what Tom Cruise did in Minority Report, <laughs> able to give advertisements tailored to his retinal image, we're doing that with one of the companies I'm involved with. I'm also involved with another company that's a director consumer hearing income. I'm involved with a company that's actually working with high school students to actually make them more financially literate and get them introduced to the stock market a lot sooner. So the hope is over the next 12 to 18 months, you're going to see a lot of announcements talking about the onshoring of critical capabilities and technologies. And then you're also going to see some really awesome announcements as it relates to, you know, people being better because of some of the innovation that's coming out of Silicon Valley and the state of California and other places across the country that are really focused on maximizing people's engagement with their surrounding environment. Oh, I love it. I love it. Well, we, we can't wait to, to stay tuned and, and to see, see what's next for, for you and in, in, in your mission as a, as a whole. Well, we're, we're very thankful to have you as part of the Muskox herd and you've been generous with your time, but before you do go, I've got, a, I've got a couple final questions for you here, Sean. So what is your biggest pet peeve? People not trusting their instincts. Um, and then end up making decisions that are counter to their own benefit. I would love for people to not only gather the data, but actually interpret the data as far as what it means to them. And if even if it runs counter to what it's telling them to do, always trust their gut. I think if we trust our guts a lot better, the world would be a much better place because we're actually more in tune with the environment and more in tune with others around us. But so that's one of the biggest pet peeves that I have. And I think that's so important is that you, your gut is not just a one-off feeling. It's an aggregation of all of the knowledge that you've accumulated in a way that we're not smart enough as humans to necessarily be able to articulate always, but the end result is there in, in your gut. I think that's fantastic it, it, advice. And, and speaking of advice, would love to hear the greatest piece of advice that, that you've received from someone else, Sean. Yeah, and I think we've shared this. Uh, well, I'll say it like this. When I was a young kid, my dad pulled me aside and said, just because of your exterior, you're going to have to work twice as hard. And that piece of advice has stuck with me to this very, very, very day, which is the reason why when I go to North DeKalb County and I'm seven out of 2000 or go to the Air Force Academy or transition back into civilian life or then come out to Silicon Valley, the transitions haven't been as difficult as they could be because I always keep that in the back of my mind from what my dad passed along to me 
is that as long as you're bringing your A game, people are going to judge you on your A game and they can't fault you for anything less. And, and Sean, I mean, what, what an amazing per perspective that you have from, from your father along those lines. I mean, I, I think addressing the fact that there is a lot of truth to that is is something that's really hard and really unfortunate. And I'm very grateful that we're doing a lot these days as a society to be aware of that and to drive change. But, but to me, that's almost a, a different topic and a very meaningful and meaty topic. But the fact that you and your family have just recognized the reality and taught you about the, the need to just be such a fantastic human to be able to, to make so many things happen is, is impressive that you've been able to to bear that weight on your on your shoulders and to be so successful and to to make so many people's lives around you so much better in in spite of that uh, it has been like such a such a blessing maybe, maybe who knows maybe it's because of of that as as well but um i think that's a great piece of advice i wish that wasn't something that had to 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 be a reality but it, it's very impressive that you've you've had that um as as a backdrop and been able to think in that men mentality in such a way that's allowed you to go to the Air Force Academy, to be successful there, to have these contacts, to be able to work across Wall Street and now Sand Hill Road and to be able to drive change that's going to further bring together everything across uh, across your background of, of work between entrepreneurship and investment and, and the military. So I, I couldn't think of a more fitting way to, to end than, than that fantastic piece of, of advice that your, your father had shared with you. Well, you're, you're too kind, sir. And thank you so much. And it's because of friends like you and having great relationships over the course of life that we all collectively get to someplace much better than where we came from. So thank you for the opportunity of sitting down and talking with you. Thank you, Sean. And we appreciate you joining the, the herd has spoken at, at Muscox. We like to say that we're, we're strong as individuals, but we're better as a herd. And we're very thankful to have you as, as part of the, the Muscox herd. So and, and, until next time, thank you very much for joining us, Sean. I appreciate it, Brad. Thank you so much for your time. Well, that's, of course, a wrap for my conversation with Sean Singleton. I uh, really appreciate Sean being part of the Muscox herd, being such a supporter of, of the brand from California and for really all that he's done to help America um, be a great country and to continue to become a better and safer version of itself. If you haven't yet checked out Muskox, do yourself a favor, go to gomuskox.com and check out the best in outdoor apparel. Um, you're gonna be thankful that you did so as you embark upon your next venture. Well, I'm sure you learned quite a bit from from Sean, perhaps a little bit of an inspirational tale of someone who's just done fantastic things and continues to look to find ways to build relationships, give back to his country, and to make his hometown of Savannah, Georgia proud. Thanks for listening. Until next time, I'm Brad Hoos of The Herd Has Spoken.